Well, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, I hope from this morning that you got, you got this idea that this whole topic is really a conflict between God's word and man's word. That's the whole, that's the crux of this whole thing. This creation evolution topic has to do with the authority of God's word versus man's ideas. That's the whole crux of it. So without any, any more introduction, let me, um, let me go on today. I thought we should, um, I thought we should help you see a little bit more of, of who I am. So this is my family. Uh, we have four boys. My, let's see. You can see that. Can you see that? Okay. Or you're going to kill the, some lights. Um, I have four boys there in there in the back, um, <clears throat> and then we have 13 grandchildren. My wife, of course, is in the front there. So just so you know where I'm coming from. Um, you see that most of my boys have lost most of their hair. They get, and um, I'm happy for that because I lost mine because of them. <laughs> and so you know that they're losing theirs because of their kids. So that's good. Well, today we want to talk about this idea of fake news of creation evolution. And, um, you know, fake news is a big deal right now. But in this topic, it's, it's a real, it, it is really prevalent. Listen to, th this, is, um, this is from Michael Denton. I'll show you his book in a minute. But he says, the influence of evolutionary theory on fields far removed from biology is one of the most spectacular examples in history of how a highly speculative idea for which there is no really hard scientific evidence, can come to fashion the thinking of a whole society and dominate the outlook of an age. Michael Denton is, is an Australian evolutionist, but he realizes that this whole idea of, of evolution and Darwinian evolution is a false idea. He said, ultimately, the Darwinian theory of evolution is no more nor less than the great cosmogenic myth of the 20th century. If you've never looked at this book before, this, is, this was a landmark book. He wasn't well liked after he wrote that book, but he spoke the truth about evolution. And um, so we're going to talk some more about the fake news of, of evolution. This is, from a, this is from a high school textbook, <clears throat> a biology book, and look what it says. It says, fossils offer the most direct evidence that evolution takes place. <laughs> then he makes a true statement, and he says, fossils, therefore, provide an actual record of Earth's past life forms. That is true. And then he ends this little passage with another falsehood where he says change over time, evolution, can be seen in the fossil record. Well, this is what we want to look at. Is this true? And I think, uh, I hope to help you look at this a little bit more as the afternoon goes on. So what we want to start out with is to say, let's, how do we know the truth? And so let's just take a, a simple example, which came first, the chicken or the egg? You know, you say, ah, come on. Well, that's the question, chicken or the egg? And there's two different views on that. Evolution would say the egg came first. Creation would say the chicken came first. This is really pretty simple, but let's just go through it for a minute. Evolution says the egg came first. Why do they say that? Well, they say that because the egg came from a dinosaur. The dinosaur laid an egg. That egg turned into a bird, which is a chicken. But what came from the, the dinosaur came from a reptile. The reptile came from an amphibian. An amphibian came from a fish. A fish came from an invertebrate, meaning an animal without a backbone. An invertebrate came from algae. Algae came from chemicals. Chemicals came from the Big Bang. And the Big Bang came from nothing. 
Now that's how you get to the egg in an evolutionary standpoint. We'll look at this a little bit more. What, is, what does creation say? Well, creation says the chicken came first. And, what's, and, and what do we base that? We say it comes from the Bible. It comes from the Bible, which is authoritative, it's inerrant, and it was an eyewitness account. Now, who was, who was present on day one? God. Only God was present. Who was present on day five? That's when chickens were made. Only God. So, but still, God gave that eyewitness account. He was there. He knew what he did. And he gave that account to Adam who wrote it down. Genesis 1 says, before there was anything, there was God. And God spoke, and then every came, everything came into existence. And on day five, it says he made most of the birds. No. He says he made all the birds, and he said you need to reproduce after your kind. I don't even have a slide about this, but this is such an important concept. If you need one little thing that will help you refute this idea of evolution, <coughs> meaning change over time, you need to remember this phrase, after its kind. That, that phrase is repeated 10 times in Genesis chapter 1. Now, I had four boys, and I can tell you that I never told them something 10 times. By the time it got to the third time, their, their bottoms were starting to roast. So I don't know what would have happened if I would have said it 10 times, but God said, reproduce after your kind. That means you can't change into another kind. Reproduce after your kind. That's what God said. I think he wanted us to get the message that change over time is not possible. Evolution is not possible. You can't change a kind into another kind. That dis does not happen. Okay, so creation would say the chickens were fully formed. They were reproduced after their kind. So how do we know the truth? How do we know from those two ideas, evolution or creation, how do we determine the truth of this? Well, we can define truth as a conformity to fact or actuality. Now, don't, don't check out here with me. This, this is not going to be hard, okay? Conformity to fact or actuality. So how do you judge that? Well, you can do two things. You can run experiments, and that would be called operational science, when I go to the laboratory and I try to duplicate something. And that's the whole basis for science, being able to reproduce things. If I write an article, no one's going to accept that on the basis of me writing that article. It's going to have to be reproduced by other people to show that it's really true. So you run experiments and those experiments have to be able to be reproducible. So that's one way that you can determine truth. The other way is to check the record. So you look at a historical record and you see what's happened in the past. So you look at historical science. Well, what's historical science? Well, you try to apply, you try to apply those two things, historical or operational science to this question. Operational science doesn't work. You cannot go back to the beginning. So there's no way to run an experiment at the beginning to test whether the egg or the chicken came first. Can't do it. So operational science doesn't, doesn't apply there. What about historical science? Well, this is really interesting. Don't get caught on this. The fossil record is one way that you can look at historical science. But the fossil record of chickens and eggs doesn't help us because they're both found in the same layer. We can't, we can't tell which came first. It's historical science, but we can't tell from that. So we have to go to a written record. And in that case, the written record of that, an eyewitness account, says the Bible, the Bible says that chickens came first. So chicken wins. All of you who like eggs, um, scramble them up. But the chicken came first. So <clears throat> what then, with this, keeping this example in mind, what then is the truth about creation evolution? Neither creation or evolution can be proven 
scientifically, operationally, scientifically, because they're both faith statements. They're based on certain assumptions of faith. Evolution says, I believe that nothing can make something. Creationists would say, we have a written record that's reliable, that we can count on, that we, is the basis for how we think about these things. So in order to understand and try to sort this out and see what is truth, we have to go and we say, let's look at the facts, facts, and see where they best line up with creation or evolution. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to look at these areas. We're going to look at science laws, and we're going to look at three laws, the law of cause and effect, we're going to look at biogenesis, and we're going to look at the law of thermodynamics. Now those are three basic, uh, <coughs> proven over and over and over again laws, and we're going to see where evolution or creation comes in. Then we're going to look at fossils. And we're going to say, hey fossils, what do they tell us? Do they line up better? Do the facts of fossils not the textbook thing that it said, but the facts of fossils, do they line up better with creation or evolution? Then we're going to look at probabilities. Now, some of you are starting to nod. I, I mean, this is, a, this is the danger of speaking after lunch. I understand that. <laughs> but I just want to let you know that this little pointer, this will put the mark of the beast on you. And if I see you nodding, I'm going to... I'm going to fry that on your forehead and you'll have to walk around with that all day. No. Anyway, <laughs> probability is not going to be that hard. And then we're going to look at design. So these are facts that we're going to look at. And we're going to say, where do those line up? Where do those line up? All right, let's get started. The law of cause and effect. <clears throat> well, the law of cause and effect states that for every material effect... There must be an adequate cause that existed before the effect. Well, for instance, when you think of the, the effect of the tsunami hitting, hitting land, you see this huge wave that caused tremendous devastation and over in Indonesia. Well, what was the cause of that? There had to be an adequate cause for this effect to be seen. It wasn't a frog jumping in, a, in, a, in the edge of the ocean. That's not an, an adequate cause for that effect. Or you see, a, you see a kid spilling his lunch. That's the effect. What was the cause? He stepped on a shoestring that wasn't tied. That's an adequate cause for that effect. You got the idea? So if you think about evolution, um, and you say, well, the effect is that we're all here. What was the cause? Is nothing exploding an adequate cause for that? It wasn't. What about the law of biogenesis? The law of biogenesis says that life only comes from life. Bio, life, genesis, or origin. So life only comes from life. It's associated with Louis Pasteur. And we're going to look at his experiment in a minute. In a minute. But before Louis Pasteur's time, people thought this way. Um, flies were created spontaneously from meat. Is that rots? And you know, that was an observation, it wasn't unreasonable, but it was wrong. It was false. So, you can run some experiments to see if this was, see what the facts are about flies coming from, from meat laying out. Well, if you have meat that's just laying out, you're going to get ma maggots and pretty soon you have flies. If you seal that jar where the meat is, you're not going to get maggots, you're not going to get flies. If you put a screen on it so that flies can't da get down there, again, you get no flies. Well, Louis Pasteur went from the meat market to the laboratory and he said, let's take broth and let's heat it up. And as we heat it up, it'll go through a trap. This is a trap and has moisture in it so that nothing can come back backwards. And when he did that, he found that nothing grew in that broth. 
if he took off this trap, then he got microorganism bacteria growing there. And that proved the law of biogenesis. And that's why things are sterilized today. So that we get rid of these bugs by boiling and sealing them off. That's, this, this is the law of, bio, of, of spontaneous generation. It doesn't happen, things don't happen from nothing. There had to be some, something that caused it and Louis Pasteur pioneered that whole idea. Hebrews 11.3 says this, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Have you ever thought about this verse? This is a verse that said God spoke things into existence. There was nothing before this. There was no material things and he spoke. And Genesis 1 outlines the sequence in which he spoke that brought everything into existence. Hebrews 3, Hebrew 3 says you don't get something from nothing apart from God. It can't happen. It doesn't happen spontaneously. All right, let's look at this third law, the law of thermodynamics. Thermodynamics, um, uh, basically, the first law, there are two laws that we're going to look at. The first law says that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It's also called the law of conservation of energy. It means that if you start with a certain amount of energy, start with a certain amount of energy, you can change it, but you're going to have that same amount of energy afterwards. So it means if I go out to build a fire and I put logs on it and I burn those, the, the energy that's in those logs is going to be the same amount of energy when that log is gone because I've gotten heat off of it. And that's the basic idea. That's the first law of, of um, thermodynamics. It's also called the law of conservation of energy never been shown to be untrue, always been shown to be true. It says that you can change energy from one kind of energy to another. You can drop a weight and turn, a, turn some uh, paddles in, a water, in water and heat that water up, but that amount of energy is always going to be the same. Never going to change. That means in order to start something, you had to have something or someone that was able to instill energy. It doesn't come from nothing. Evolution says it came from nothing and it exploded and you got everything. That, that's contrary to the first law of thermodynamics. But the Bible says God spoke, that was the energy and he energized this whole universe and has been constant since then. Now, that's, that law is, is, um, is used in conjunction with the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics says that useful energy decreases with time. Um, what, what's your name? Yeah, I picked on you before, but what's your name? Caleb. Caleb? Caleb, tell me, when you clean your room, I mean once a year, yeah. yeah, when you clean it and you do nothing else to that room, what happens to that room? It's dirty. It gets dirty. See, this is the second law of thermodynamics. When you have, when you, when you have something that's in, or, in an orderly way and you leave it with time, it doesn't stay the same. It's going, to go to, it's going to start to degenerate and it's going to start to decrease in its useful energy. So from back to this diagram again, if you have energy before, it's going to go to the same amount of energy afterwards, but only usable energy, that usable energy is going to decrease. Some of it, like the fire, goes into ashes, some of it goes into smoke, some of it goes into heat, but you've lost usable energy. Now, total energy is the same, but useful energy has decreased. Now, think about this for a minute. <clears throat> if you look at this bottom diagram and you think of evolution, what does evolution tell... Excuse me. That, oh, man, I just screwed things up here. Excuse me. Um, uh, 
All right, I'm sorry. Let's see what we can do. Hang in with me, we'll get there in just a second. That was um, that was a law of thermodynamics that was counteracted. Uh, something came out of nothing there, but anyway, let's let's get back here and see if I can help us with this. When we think of evolution, we we think of something that remember is nothing. Remember before before the Big Bang there was nothing, and what happens over time? Over time, energy and orderliness increases. Mm, that's why we're here. That's what evolution would say. What does creation say? Creation says that in the beginning, God spoke, and since that time, things have been going downhill. The laws of thermodynamics are, are diametrically opposed to the theory of evolution. Does that make sense to you? So when we're talking about entropy, we're thinking of things like disorder. It's also called the law, the a law of a disorder or the law of entropy, and that means that if you start with something very orderly, like an ice cube, and you give it time, it will melt. It will become more disordered, and you get a puddle of water. This is the second law of thermodynamics. All right. <clears throat> now let's let's look and see how does this all apply to these two things. Well, evolution says that nothing. Hmm, Evolution says nothing leads to something, leads to everything. But what, what are the facts? The facts are that nothing leads to nothing, not everything. There's no spontaneous generation. That means life had to come from other life. It can't be just arising by itself. And it says the laws of thermodynamics show that it's impossible. What about creation? The, the laws of science applied to creation, they're consistent with that. They're consistent with that premise that says we have an all-knowing, all-powerful God that did all of this. That's the, that's, the, that's the cause that allows for all this effect. That's the cause that says things are going downhill. That's the cause that says life didn't come from nothing. It came from other life when God spoke those into existence. So the fake news some more fake news about science, the laws of science. You've heard this, evolution, science, creation is religion. That's false. We've just tried to show you that a little bit. The facts of science support evolution. You'll hear that a lot. That's false. The laws of science confirm <laughs> creation. Okay? So now let's go to the second area. Let's go to fossils. Let's go to fossils and see how the facts of fossils either line up with evolution or creation. <clears throat> so what are fossils? Well, fossils are the preserved remains or traces of once living organisms. Those are, that's what fossils are. So they once were, now they're dead, and now we have, we have um, some remains or traces of those remains, like footprints, of once living organisms. We see all kinds of fossils. Most of them are sea creatures. Most, you know, 95% of them are sea creatures. But we also have dinosaurs and other kinds of fossils, but of once living organisms. So how are fossils formed? Well, number one, they have to die. So in order to become a fossil, you have to be dead. Now, I think, I think this, 
this is not always true because I think I had a Latin teacher that was a fossil. <laughs> but, but, but in general, you have to be dead to be a fossil. Okay. Um, apologies to any Latin teachers, excuse me. You have to have rapid burial. You can't have a slow process of burying because if you have a slow process, that thing rots. So you have to have rapid burial. We're going to see some examples of this in the future. And you have to have isolation so that nothing else gets to it. So that you don't have water running through it or something that dissolves it away. Dead, rapid burial, isolation. That's how you get fossils. All right, so let's, let's look at some facts about the fossil record as we see it today. Number one, you see sudden appearance. We'll look at each of these in a minute. You get stasis. Stasis, oh boy, that's, that's another one of these not off words. No, it's not really. We'll help you with that in just a second. You have no transition forms. We don't see transition forms in the fossil record. You have worldwide distribution. It means something must have happened to, 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 sh to do something on a worldwide scale to make things die and be preserved. <laughs> You find them in sedimentary rock. 75% of the rock on, this, on the whole world is sedimentary rock. Sedimentary rock, say that real quick, sedimentary rock. You know, it means rock that's been laid down by water. That's all that that means. You see ecological layering. Now this is really scientific. But eco, what's an ecology? It's, it's, it's that area where things live. So you see ecological layering, layering. We'll talk about that more in a minute. And then you have some things that have to do with aber aberrant dating, things that don't seem to fall into a sequence very well. So it's called aberrant dating. I'll give you some examples of that. And then we see polystrate fossils, things that shouldn't exist, but they do exist. So we're going to try to look at these facts about fossils and say, where do they line up best, with creation or with evolution? All right, let's get started. So what we see is sudden appearance of the fossils. If you look at a, a diagram of fossils, forget about the ages. Th those, this, is just all, th this is just meant to show you that there is a place down at the bottom here, it's on the rug, but down here where there aren't any fossils. So all of a sudden, if you go digging down in the earth, you will find different, different layers and different fossils but you come to a point where there are no more fossils. And that area where they start is called, is called the Cambrian Explosion. And all of a sudden there's gobs and gobs of fossils. Something happened that allowed all these fossils to come about. They weren't there before, and then all of a sudden you see them. So that's, that's uh, called the Cambrian Explosion. So you see, this is what you see in the fossil record. Doesn't matter who it is, where it is, this is what you'll see. The Cambrian explosion. No fossils below that area, and then all of a sudden, all kinds of fossils. Remember I said stasis? What does stasis mean? Stasis, don't get yourself nodding off. Is that, is that hand just, that's best for your head to rest on that hand? <laughs> all right, this is what stasis means. It means that, <clears throat> that, remember we have no fossils down here, and all of a sudden, we have all kinds of fossils. This is at this Precambrian, Cambrian junction. And once you start seeing fossils, you get what's called stasis. That means that these babies don't change. They stay the same. Now look at this diagram. This is from an evolutionist. It says, well, there must have been a time when all of these went to some other thing, but they're dotted lines. We don't know where they came from. The only thing we know is that all of a sudden we see them, and once we see them, they stay the same. We see stasis. That's the fact of the fossil record. No changes. We see stasis. All right, what else? No transition forms. Transition forms would be a form that one kind is going to another kind. Well, this is Lee Strobel. He wrote, he's written several books, but remember Lee Strobel was, an, was, was basically an atheist, agnostic, wrote for the Chicago Tribune, and he became a Christian. And he wrote this book called The Case for Faith, and he said this. He said, initially troubling to me 
was the paucity of fossil evidence for transitions between the various species of animals. He said even Darwin conceded that the lack of these fossils is, quote, is perhaps the most obvious and serious objection. That's what Darwin said in his book, 19, or 1859, The Origin of the Species. He says, the, the most obvious and serious objection to my theory is that we don't find those things. But Darwin thought, and go on with this quote, but Strobel says, so that was his biggest problem with his theory. Although he confidently predicted, Darwin confidently predicted, that as more fossils were discovered, he would be vindicated. They'd find more. Well, what happened? That was 1859. <clears throat> David Ropp, who is the curator of the Field Museum in Chicago, that has billions of fossils, huge repertoire of fossils in that museum. He's speaking at the 120th anniversary of Darwin's or writing of the origin of the species. This is what he said. He said, well, we are now about 120 years after Darwin. And knowledge of the fossil record has been greatly expanded. Ironically, we have even fewer examples of evolutionary transition than we did in Darwin's day. This hope that Darwin had, that give me enough time and we'll see all these transitions, Rob says, we're, a, we're 120 years later, we've got billions of fossils, and we've got l fewer examples of transition form than we ever did. It well, turns out there are no, un, there are no unquestionable transition forms in the fossil record. None! Zero! And Rop was referring to the horse series that, that used to be held up as a great series of transitions from one kind to another. It turned out to be false. So, no transition forms. What about worldwide distribution? We see fossils all over the place, all over all the continents, on islands, all over the world. Something happened rapidly to bury and isolate fossils. That answers in Genesis. We like to say, you know, we've got some Australians there, and they have a certain way of saying stuff. And so Ken's fond of saying, we have billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. That's a good saying. That's what fossils are. Billions of dead things buried in sedimentary rock, rock layers laid down by water, and they're all over the earth. Okay. Sedimentary rock, where do we find it? We find it in the Grand Canyon. We find it in Britain. We find it in Africa. We find it in Australia. It's all over the place. All right, let's look at this idea, ecological layering. Remember I told you we we're going to get to that word in a minute? Ecological layering just means that things tend to be buried where they lived. So that means that, that um, if, if you look at seashells or things that lived on the bottom of the ocean, you'd expect to see them buried at the bottom. If you, if you had birds, you wouldn't expect them to be buried first because they were able to fly and they would have been buried later on. That's ecological layering. Andrew Snelling, a geologist at Answers in Genesis, says, says this. I know this might put you to sleep, but just hang on. This is a very good statement. The order of fossils in the rock record can be accounted for by the year-long flood. As a result of the pre-flood biogeography, that means where things lived before, and ecological zonation, that means where they were in the water when the waters came. <clears throat> so the early burial of marine creatures like seashells and later on fish, fish are not all bottoms, you might see them a little bit higher up, and moving water, how that sorts things out, and the behavior of things, whether they could fly, swim, flee, all of those things is what we see with this ecological layering. That is better explained by the flood of Noah. So if you go back to this, this example again, you'll see things in different layers, and that's dependent upon where they're buried. And the things that would, you'd expect to be at the bottom are at the bottom. Things that, that you might expect not to be at the bottom, well, they're not there. 
All right, so now let's look at this idea of dating for a minute. We're just gonna, we're just gonna look at this because we need, to, we need to understand that dating has to do with fossils. <clears throat> there are three basic assumptions of dating. These are good for any kind of dating, whether it's carbon, uranium, any kind of radiometric dating. It has to do with three basic assumptions. Number one, the rate at which they, that, that radioactive material decays is constant. The second thing is that there are no initial daughter products. So when one thing changes into another, that's the daughter product. At the beginning, there was none of those things. And the third, the third assumption is that you have a closed system where nothing is added or taken away. Those are the three basic assumptions. Now you can look at each one of those and say, hmm, can we prove those things? Really, not so much. This is just to be a little lighthearted, that's all. All right, so now let's look at carbon-14, carbon because everyone's heard of carbon-14 dating. Carbon-14 dating is, is a pretty simple thing, but it's very helpful to us, and it helps us sort out this age question. Carbon-14 is made as cosmic rays hit nitrogen in the atmosphere, and that changes that, that element into a radioactive form of carbon. That's called carbon-14. That carbon-14 combines with oxygen to get carbon dioxide, and so you get fruit, you get plants using carbon dioxide to make their fruit, and, and so we eat the fruit, we eat the plants, the cows eat it, we drink the milk. So lo and behold, what happens is that we get carbon-14 in our system. Every living system has a ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12. As long as I'm living, as long as we're living, we will have a rate of carbon-14 coming in, and that rate will be balanced by, by um, how it's decaying. But once we die, we have no more carbon-14 coming in. We're not taking in any more carbon-14. And so as things die, then you start to lose carbon-14, but you don't have any uh, increase in that. So that means, that means this little diagram will help you. When something is at the time of death, you have a mixture of carbon-12 and carbon-14. Those, those, car those carbons work the same. You don't, you don't just get certain things working with carbon-14 versus carbon-12. Carbon's carbon. It doesn't matter whether it's radioactive or not. So and when you die, you have a certain ratio of these two things. And as time goes on, more of this carbon-14 decays because it's radioactive and it decays away, but the amount of carbon-12 remains the same. So what that, what that means is that you can look at a ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14, and you can get an idea of how long things have been dead. And it's, you might think, well, it's one-to-one. -one. No, it's not one-to-one. -one. The, the amount of carbon-12 is, is a trillion times more than what we have of carbon-14. So all of you have carbon-14. You didn't know your rate. Did you know you're radioactive? Yeah, you are. <laughs> anyway, so, but it's a very small amount. It's a very small amount. And after you die, you'll start to lose that. And you lose it at a rate, remember we said, that rate is pretty constant, not perfect, but pretty constant. So for carbon, carbon-14, the half-life, meaning how long it takes for half of that carbon-14 to, to change, to disappear, is 5,700 years. 5,700 years. So if we have something that is... Um, five half-lives, if we have something that's a little less than 30,000 years old, been dead for 30,000 years old, we're going to have one, <coughs> one um, atom of carbon-14 to 32 trillion. That's the ratio now of carbon-12. What that means, that you don't have to worry about these numbers except to say this, that carbon-14 can't last a long time. So at the extreme, at the extreme, once you get something dead for 100,000 years, you're going to have no carbon-14 left. Nothing. And that's not just my idea. That's, those are, these are the facts, okay? So if someone says to you, 
Uh, we have this dinosaur bone, and it's 70, we know it's 70 million years old, and um, how much carbon-14 would it have? Zero. I mean, remember we said you're not going to find any carbon-14 in, any, in anything that's over 100,000 years old. So to say this is 70 million years, and you say how much carbon-14, you say, are you, are you crazy, man? That can't last that long. Well, and you say, well, what about other things like coal and oil and other things that once were, came from living things that have carbon in them? What happens if we date those things? Remember, those are hundreds of, mil hundreds of millions of years old. What about that, that thing that shines on your finger, ladies? That diamond. How old is that? Well, De Beers, De Beers the, science, the, uh, the, the diamond people would say, billions of years ago, when these fabulous rocks were formed in the internal furnace of the earth, then volcanic action pushed them toward the center. And now we've dug them up and polished them just for you. You not heard that commercial? Now, you know, so they say they're billions of years old. So how much carbon-14 would we find in diamonds? Zero. I mean, my goodness. Why even waste your time checking it? Well, lo and behold, somebody had the audacity to say, well, let's just for fun, let's check. And so what we find is, and the creationists have done this, not in their own laboratories, but in evolutionary laboratories. They've taken and ground up diamonds. They ground up diamonds. And lo and behold, they carbon-14 date for around 6,000 years. Does it, let that sink in for a minute. That means that Hmm, perhaps they aren't that old. And then when they did coal and they did oil and they dated those things, carbon-based things, they find that they're young. There's something that's screwy with this whole idea of dating. And the idea that carbon-14 is found in these millions of years old things, that's fake news, boys. That's fake news. It's been shown not to be true. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm already sweating. I mean, that's exciting. You get the idea. Okay, so let's see. I'm off on carbon-14 here. So carbon-14, and let me just summarize this. So you see no carbon-14 present in anything over 100,000 years. And interestingly enough, if you start dating things with carbon-14 that you know how old they are, say trees that you count the rings and stuff, you'll find that it start, the, the accuracy of carbon-14 date falls off very quickly once you get over maybe 10,000 years, maybe less than that. You get those higher dates, it's impossible. So if anyone ever tells you that, that dinosaur fossil was dated to 75 million or 70 million years ago because of carbon-14, Chalk them off. They don't know what they're telling you. They're pulling the wool over your eyes. That's fake news. What else? So carbon-14 is only good for recent events, not for old events. It can, it's, there's, impossible, there's impossible to have old events from carbon-14. You find only carbon-14 in previously living materials. That means you can't go out and find a rock, at least a rock that's not made out of carbon like diamonds, or coal, but regular rock, you can't date them with carbon. How do they date, how do they date living things and rocks? They don't, rate, they don't date them by carbon-14 of those specimens. They date them by the age of the rock. And that's an assumption from evolution. So <clears throat> you cannot accurately date old tissue by carbon-14. Did I say that enough? You cannot do that. Someone tells you that, that's fake news. So diamonds, every time you look at your wedding band, just remember, that baby's young. No matter what De Beers says, it's still very valuable, but it's young. Okay. Other radioactive 
uh, materials are used to date rocks, other types of rocks that were not living. So you can have uranium lead, you can have potassium argon, you have lots of different radioactive material that decays into something else. <coughs> those are used, and those are, we're talking about millions of years old. So in their dating system, their half-lives are not 5,700 years. Those are millions of years half-lives. So you see, you introduce a lot of error when you try to extrapolate the age of these things. So that's how radioactive decay works. Now, what about this idea of aberrant dating? Aberrant dating means that some things just don't make sense. So if you tried to date lava from volcanoes and you knew when that lava came out of that volcano and you date it, and that age doesn't jive with when you know it came about, that's aberrant. So, this is from uh, New Zealand. And there were five eruptions back in 1949 to 75. And they dated those lava flows and they dated from 270,000 to 3.5 million years. When you see a range like that, you can say, kiss it, maybe it's not true. Okay, it's fake news. There are a lot of other volcanoes from Hawaii, from New Zealand, from uh, Sicily, from Arizona, aberrant dates, things that you know when they, they, they erupted, and yet you get these dates that are way out of line. That makes sense? That, th these, are, these are the facts of science. This is how, this is how you, can, you, can, you can start to understand fossils. So aberrant dating. What about polystrate fossils? Polystrate fossils just means poly means many strata, Okay, something that's found over many layers. For instance, um, okay, I, I just said that, didn't I didn't know. Okay, so here's an example of it. So these, these, this, is a, this is a tree, a tree uh, um, trunk, and it's in between, it's growing in between all of these layers of rock. These layers of rock have been laid down over millions of years. Does that jive with what, does that jive with anything? I mean, remember, how could something, how could something like this tree exist for millions of years through all these layers and still be there? I mean, we, we see this other places. We, we see them in Germany, we see them in Tennessee, we see them up in Canada. We see polystrate fossils, these uh, usually, usually they're trees, but going through millions of years of, of, of different layers of strata. Impossible. You, you understand what I'm saying? It's not possible. Polystrate fossils said the evolution, there's something wrong with this evolutionary scenario. Well, maybe, maybe those babies weren't laid down over millions of years. Could that make sense? Maybe this tree was growing and had all this sediment laid down. And as Andrew Snelling said, as you start flowing sediment, uh, water-laden rock through things, they layer. Well, we had an example of that at Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens, this is, um, this is Mount St. Helens. It lost its top, came down, just scoured the landscape and, and cleaned off thousands and thousands of trees stripped off the bark, it settled down in the bottom of Spirit Lake is what you see here, and these trees started just floating, and some sinking to the bottom in the middle of this, of this lake, of Spirit Lake. Hmm. Now, if we came back in several years, hmm, I don't know how many years, maybe a hundred years, maybe, maybe a thousand years, we might find something, oh, we might find something hmm, like this at Yellowstone, where you see the petrified forest. And the, and the people at Yellowstone will say, you see, these things, there was once a tree here and it grew, and then we laid down a lot of other stuff, and pretty soon another tree grew, and these are all millions of years old. What? These are all laid down at the time of some catastrophe, like we saw at Mount St. Helens, and these layers were later eroded away from these, and it looks like, 
they were laid down at different times, that they grew at different times. False. False. Okay. So now let's go back to our biology textbook. Fossils offer the most direct evidence that evolution takes place. That's false. Fossils, therefore, provide an actual record of the Earth's past life form. That's true. Fossils are dead things that are buried, and we can see the history of the Earth. But then it says, change over time, evolution, can be seen in the fossil record. That's false. So, the fake news of, of um, this whole thing of creation evolution with, in regards to fossils is that evolution doesn't cut it. Are you still with me? You've got your, arm, your head off your arm, so I must have done something. Are you just... Anyway, so, so let's, um, let's go on here. What about probabilities? Now, this is really going to put somebody out. All right, so probabilities. What's a probability? Probability is, the, is a number expressing the likelihood of an occurrence of a specific event means the chance that something happened. That's what it means. That's a probability. So when the lottery says you got one chance in 50 million, that's not very good. If you flip a coin, you got a one chance in two that you're going to get heads. That's what, this is what probability has to do. Let's just give you some other examples. If you have an order of 10 cards, and you want to see what the order of finding a certain sequence of those 10 cards are, the chances are one chance and 3,628,800. That's the chance of finding that sequence of 10 cards. What's the probability of finding the specific order of 100 cards? I mean, these, are, th th these aren't my numbers. These are mathematical numbers. This is how probabilities work. The chance of finding a certain sequence of 100 cards by random processes is one chance in 10 to the 158th power. That means 10 with 150 zeros after it. I don't even know what that number is. It's so long that we use these scientific notations to say it. Well, you need to remember that mathematicians will tell you the odds of 1 in 10 to the 50th is impossible. Just consider it impossible. So the chances of getting 10 cards or 100 cards in a certain sequence, it's impossible. <coughs> so look at the information in a single cell. In a single cell, there is the information in that single cell, in this something you can't even see except under the microscope. It has the information of about a hundred, or about a million pages of the encyclopedia. That's the information in one cell. So what are the chances that a cell was originated by accidental chance processing? The number is 10 to the 78,436th power. That means 10 with that many zeros after it. Anybody know that number? It, it's, it's way more than impossible. I mean, you've got to be a fool to think this way. And that's being kind. <laughs> Julian Huxby, Huxley, who was an evolutionist, said that the chance of a horse evolving is, is one chance in 10 to the 3 millionth power. Richard Dawkins, who's perhaps one of the foremost uh, evolutionists of our day, says this. The more statistically improbable a thing is, the less we can believe that it just happened by blind chance. Hmm. Superficially, I get that word, superficially, the obvious alternative to chance is an intelligent designer. What? This is coming from an evolutionist. But he, he puts a little caveat in there. He says, well, superficially, that's the case. But is it really true? Well, Mathematicians are not friends of evolutionists, I can tell you. When you go to an evolutionary conference, you won't find mathematicians asked to speak at those conferences. Because the probabilities, the numbers of those things make, make 
evolution impossible. So the numbers, this idea that the numbers, the probabilities support evolution, that's false. Okay, let's look at one more thing. We're just about done here. The one more thing, let's look at design. What is design? What do the facts of design tell us? Well, design, <clears throat> the definition of design is an intelligent plan for creating. That's what design is. Charles Darwin, in his book, back in 1859, said this. He said, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Darwin understood that. He just had faith that someone it would happen over time. So, what's, what's the idea? Well, if you look at the Golden Gate Bridge, would anybody, would anybody in their right mind say that that just happened over time and chance? No, no one would. I mean, I tried to find a piece of, a, a, a slide of steel, and goodness, if you let that pile of steel sit there for a million years, would that change into the Golden Gate Bridge? No, I mean, it's obvious. It wouldn't do that. And this is the trouble that I had. The ding-dong steel, that's been orderly stacked. I mean, you know, goodness, everyone thinks of order, and somebody did it. Somebody did that, and somebody that did that was a pretty smart boy or girl. But they were pretty smart that did that. It didn't happen by chance. Everyone can see that. What about space? When we look at space and we see all the stars and we see these galaxies and we see beauty, but we see orderliness. Why do you think we send rockets up to the moon or to distant stars or to Mars or these different places? We do that because things are orderly. They follow laws. We can, we can know that when we do certain things, it's going to happen because, my goodness, it looks like it's designed. It's not some random process. Space isn't some random process. It's a completely orderly event. But evolutionists would say, oh, it just blew up. Nothing blew up. And all of a sudden, we have everything that we see in the sky. And they coalesced over time. And come on, get, get a life here. This is craziness. What about living things? When you look at a peacock tail, peacock's tail, hmm, does that look like random things that happen? That looks like there's something in that peacock's genetic makeup that would put orderliness and beauty and design into that tail. What about this? Maybe you've seen this picture before. The surgeon is operating on an, an unborn baby in utero. And as he's doing that, he has his hand there and that child grasps his fingers. I, it doesn't show up very much. This is the baby's hands grasping the surgeon. You tell me that's a chance type thing? You tell me that those things are chance? This is design, this is exquisite. This is exquisite design. What about chemistry and physics? When you look at the, the DNA molecule, would anyone, anyone in their right mind tell you that that's a chance happening of chemicals? I mean, this is an orderly thing that has so much information in it that we're marveling at it. it design in chemistry speaks for a designer. How about, how about an atom? Do you ever think about the structure of an atom? It's exquisitely designed. It's not random things. It follows certain laws. Design implies the designer. Michael Behe, who is um, he's a Catholic boy, um, he wrote this book called Darwin's Black Box. It's again one of these um, one of these very important books that creationists need to read. Um, and he said, uh, you know, we need to look at this idea of irreducible complexity. And he gives the example of a mousetrap. He says, this thing is irreducibly complex. 
If you get rid of any one of these five components, you don't have a mousetrap. You got it? That's irreducibly complex. That didn't happen by chance. You can't get all those five things to happen by chance. Irreducible complexity says there's, there's a designer there. And that designer knew what he was doing. Well, as we've gotten more sophisticated and can look at that little, that little hair type thing on the back of a cell that's called a flagella, when we look at that, we find it's not just a little hair on the thing that's sticking out. We find that it's an unbelievably complex motor that's powered by hydrogen or sodium ions. This is irreducible complexity. Those things don't happen by chance. So, let's summarize things. Richard Hoyle, who is um, a pretty famous guy, said, the chance that higher life forms have emerged in this way, meaning evolution, is comparable with the chance that a tornado would sweep through a junkyard and that that might result in a 747 being produced. He's not a creationist, but he says this idea of design shouts out for a designer. Design implies a designer. Okay, so design in nature, this is how the evolutionists would say. They'd say, well, it's just apparent, it's not real. Are those examples to you? They're apparent, all right, but they're more than apparent. You can't just discount that because you think, oh, well, it just, we, just, we just happened to be here, so we must have happened by chance. That's a philosophy. It has nothing to do with science. It has nothing to do with the facts that we've seen. That idea is false. The idea that this is just apparent, it's really not real design, that's false. Okay, so where does all this lead us? It leads us to this. It leads us that God's word is an authoritative, inerrant account of truth for science, for history, for salvation. We know from the Bible that Jesus is the word and he became flesh. And there's an opportunity because of that for us to come into a personal relationship with Jesus, our Savior, who was first our Creator. First Thessalonians says, First Thessalonians 5, 21, 22 says, test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. John 14, 6 says, Jesus answered and said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's a lot of fake news out there about creation evolution. But we can be sure that God's word is completely trustworthy and that it holds the true answers to life's questions. Oh, by the way, true science is on the creation side of the question. Praise the Lord. Okay. Thank you for your attention. You didn't fall asleep. You did pretty well. Proud of you. And uh, uh, tomorrow we're going to, um, tomorrow in the morning, we're going to talk about the flood of evidence. So um, if you want to read Genesis um, 6 through 9, that might be a good thing to do in the midst of writing your paper tonight on, on Paul and Peter. Um, just one little, we, we need to make a plug here. These, um, the publisher of this book, um, uh, the um, what, what, what's the name of that? Bruce Malone. Yeah, Bruce Malone is his name, and he wrote this book, and it's it's called. Have you considered? Have you considered? It's a daily devotional book. When I called him and said, Bruce, I'm going down to Teen Missions, he said to me, How many students are there? I told him. He said, I want every one of those people to have it. So if you're a student, you don't have to pay two bucks for it. Take one of those books. There's others back there that, you know, that are free. There's some that cost you a little bit better, but there's not a lot. Make sure you sign up if you want for that newsletter from Answers in Genesis 
from uh, Creation Ministries International, from the Institute for Creation Research. Those things come every month. They're very informative to keep you up to date on what's happening. Um, so sign up to those, for those things. I'll send those into those organizations. And then I told you about that, that, that sheet that, that gave you addresses for Institute for Creation Research, Creation Ministries International, Answers in Genesis. And I said, I also included three groups in there that you need to be aware of. One is reason to believe. One is... <laughs> one, one is... Um, Okay. I know. It's been, it's long. I should have my head on my, I should have my head on, on my arm on my, my head on my arm. Okay. That's what. Be careful of reasons to believe, Discovery Institute, and BioLogos. BioLogos, that was the one I was forgetting earlier. Be, be aware of those things. Not to say that you can't read them. I'm not for not reading that stuff. But I'm saying be careful of those because those people are compromised with Scripture. Have a good afternoon. Thank <clears throat> you.